Joined now by the former executive producer of Hockey Night in Canada and the uh, host of the Bob McCallum, co-host yeah. of the Bob McCallum podcast. No, no. Sorry, no, I don't right. want to. Oh, well, right. I don't want to promote you. I don't want to get in trouble here with the Bob guy. Uh, <laughs> that, that's, that's assuming I've he will spoken hear it. out of turn. Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. John Shannon, how are you, sir? I'm great, boys. How do you enjoy your time uh, in beautiful British Columbia? You know what. Uh, I got on the road to the Kelowna airport Sunday morning and I said, why the heck am I leaving? What is going on? Another beautiful day in paradise. It was, it was a spectacular week. It was a great night at the BC Hockey Hall of Fame. Uh, it could not have been a better six day experience than, uh, than what I had, including, uh, three days at Fairview Mountain. Wow. Cool. I used to get a pit in my stomach, John, when the, flight took off from YVR and I'd look down on the ocean and the city and the mountains and go, why don't I live here? So I understand wow. it, buddy. Um, yeah. Tell us about the Hockey Hall of Fame. Seabrook Keith and uh, Lonnie Cameron. Yeah. Uh, and all three well uh, deserving, but I, I will tell you what, uh, and Jimmy Houston did a marvelous job as the chairman of the, uh, uh, of the hall and, uh, and master of ceremonies. Uh, and you can see why, Duncan, Keith, and Brent Seabrook worked so well together because they brought down the house in Penticton, uh, and so did their kids. You know, one of the most touching moments of the night uh, for me and for anybody that was there was uh, about two minutes into his speech, Brent Seabrook broke down, thanking his mom and dad and being tough on him, and his 10-year-old son, came to his side and hugged him to console him. It was oh. something I have never seen before. It was a memorable moment. I'm sure it's a moment that Brent will remember, and I know anybody who was at the hall that night uh, was just, uh, we, by the time the hug finished, we were all tearing up. It was just a magnificent moment. And D D Duncan Keith, who I never thought had the gift for the gab, holy smokes, Duncan, uh, Duncan was just fantastic. Those two guys, uh, uh, you know, British Columbia has tons to be proud of with those two guys representing them. Although I would say that Canuck fans aren't necessarily thrilled with them, but uh. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, and it's been that kind of of week, uh, John. I mean, we, we all covered it uh, during those three straight series against the Blackhawks, and just how much that team was fueled by British Columbia hockey players because Seabrook and Keith weren't the only ones, uh, particularly uh, early on in that Hawks uh, dynasty. Andrew Ladd from Maple Ridge, and he had others sure. um, others there as well. Well, the Canucks could have drafted uh, – uh, Jeff, you would probably remember this. I think the Canucks could have drafted either of those two guys, couldn't they? Uh, uh, well, maybe Keith, Keith for sure because he was Keith's a second-round second round pick. pick. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So, so he, he could he could have been a – he could have been wearing number two for the Canucks rather than for the Blackhawks. Mm. Dare hey, to dream. The long list of BC guys that got away with Jamie yeah. Van and Brendan Gallagher well, and, yeah. and others. It, it's funny you say that because uh, you know it, I know Jeff, you're a you're a, an interior boy too. But uh, um, how many times did we reminisce as children that there are two guys in the National Hockey League from British yeah. Columbia? Two, not 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 mm -hmm. fifty, not yeah. sixty, mm -hmm. but two. And I now know, we're going to have back-to-back -back first overall picks in all likelihood in Bedard and, and Macklin Celebrini. Like, this is a golden age right now, and, and those guys were sort of on the, the leading edge of, of the wave. Yeah, exactly. That's fantastic. <laughs> the, the game's in good shape in BC. Yeah. Well, and, and John, um, you know, for years, British Columbia had a disadvantage because all the other provinces got their fair share of naturally frozen ice to be able to go <laughs> out and skate on, or they had dads putting together, moms and dads building rinks in the backyard or in the school, and it got cold enough that you were able to. But of course, as you know, the South Island, the Lower Mainland, it has been many years where you get the natural frozen ice for a long enough period of time. So what BC did was build facilities and I think we're starting to see the fruit of that is the facilities out here are fantastic. Mm -hmm. I, I know minor hockey parents can say we need more, and that's absolutely right. But going back 20, 30 years, as you were saying, it was um, it was very difficult for this province to compete with the others in terms of player production because of the, the geography and nothing more. Well, 
Well, n not to date myself, Matt, but uh, you know, I, I grew up in a town that didn't have an arena. We were a <laughs> we were a good old fashioned basketball town in so in the South Okanagan, uh, and it wasn't until I was 16 or 17 years old where they uh, they built an arena during the BC Centennial. Oh, there wasn't an arena at Oliver. No. No, and yeah, and wow. and if everybody knows Oliver, you you had to go high into the, up into the hills to find a frozen, frozen pond to try to skate on. Yeah. Well, times have changed, and uh, like I said, BC is riding high right now, in developing, elite hockey players. Hey, let's move on to BC's team, the Vancouver Canucks. We've been talking contention this week, John, looking at what's prevented them from contending, what they need to do from contending how far away do you think they are from being a cup contender whether that's years whether that's a number of players but what's your sense of the future path here now that i'll say this they finally have alignment from ownership hockey executive and head coach and that is yep. a positive development it is you know uh, i think that that's a, a huge factor i i think that uh, you know patrick alvin and jim rutherford have finally got most people in the organization in lockstep, including the owner, which is, I think is an important part of that. Um, I think there's two tiers to the discussion, Matt. Uh, cup contender, you know, Jimmy won't be happy, but it's a ways away. Um, playoff contender, how good is Thatcher Demko? How good will he be able to play and stay healthy uh, to be a difference maker? You know, you look at their forwards, and you look at who they've added. I mean, I, I don't think offense is really the issue. I think it's how they defend in their own zone and how good the goaltending is for them to be a, a factor in the Pacific Division. Yeah, and penalty kill too, and that goes hand in hand with you. Like the last two seasons, penalty kill has absolutely done them in. They think they address some of that in free agency. If they could even be league average in penalty kill, I mean, that would be an incredible improvement from being 32nd and, and 31st the last couple of years. So... You know, they didn't make a huge splash in free agency, but that was targeted that the guys they brought in, uh, certainly they're hoping, can address that area of the game. Well, I don't think there's any question that uh, they're, they're trying to do something that we haven't seen in Vancouver for a long time, and that's build a system that will, you know, you can almost have interchangeable parts on. Uh, and, and that's something that, uh, you know, that's, and the onus is on Rick Tockett to make sure that works. And, and if, he, if Rick can do that um, and be more, again, more defensively responsible, and you're right, Jeff, penalty kill is a big part of that because scoring's never been a problem. Nobody's ever sh yeah. said, well, the Canucks can't score. We know they can score. But, it, you know, it's, it's in their own half of the ice. That's, that's always been the concern. And if Tockett can get them to play a controlled game, may not be as exciting as some f fans want, but if Rick Tockett can get them to play a controlled game, um, then I think that uh, they're going to scare a few teams, particularly in the Pacific. Mm. And I think one of the most important things for this upcoming season is to get off to a good start or at least not get buried in the month of October for a third consecutive year here. John, they do actually open the season this year at home against Edmonton, but then it's another five-game road trip, Edmonton, Philly, Tampa, Florida, and Nashville. I know you've answered this question for us in the past but just help us out because you know fans here remember the days of, of gillis and gilman flying to new york and browbeating the, the schedule maker with their all their intel from the sleep doctor how much say do nhl teams actually have on the schedule and could a team like vancouver request in october where they're not on a big long road trip or is that just unfeasible given how all the dominoes all the pieces have to fit together uh, in the greater in the greater um, matrix of the schedule. Yeah, well, you know, teams are required to provide 50 dates for 41 home games, um, and then you have the the issue uh, of requirements requirements of networks, and you have Rogers with uh, three network nights in Canada, and then you have what ESPN and TNT have to deal with so the schedule maker has a, a really unenviable task and and the other problem becomes is making sure that Calgary Edmonton and Vancouver are in lockstep with each other when it comes to dates 
Because you, you, you know, if you're the Pittsburgh Penguins of Philadelphia Flyers, you're not going to be making a single road trip to Vancouver. You want to do Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver, probably Seattle uh, at the same time. So that becomes an issue. And then you have to put in the, you know, I, I'm going to call it the Taylor Swift effect. It's not about Taylor <laughs> Swift, but it's about concerts. When you think about concerts that are coming, and all you have to do is look at what's happening with the Jonas Brothers that are coming in November. So all of a sudden, when revenue becomes an important thing, as much as, you know, hockey teams become important for arenas, it's a domino effect that affects everything. And, and I think that probably what happened is, is the Canucks didn't have a didn't really emphasize how they wanted to start at home as much as they said, well, we, we want certain times of the year around Christmas time. Uh, and perhaps there, perhaps Patrick and Jimmy have a philosophy with, uh, with their schedule that they want to be home in March. So, you know, that means you're going to have to be on the road a lot in the first half of the season. And that's kind of the issues that every team in the NHL has, particularly teams in Western Canada and the Pacific Northwest. Hey, just one quick follow up. Would the presence of Seattle now allow theoretically for a second Western road trip for these Eastern teams you're talking about? Like you come do Alberta in one session, you come do Seattle, Vancouver in another? As much as that sounds like a really good idea, Matt, I'm going to tell no. I don't. I don't think the mm -hmm. team. You know, teams just don't want to be doing that. Um, and and then it goes back to those other obligations I talked to, particularly for the big U.S. markets, when it comes to what they have to do for ESPN and TNT. Big news of the week, John Patrice Bergeron announcing his retirement in Boston. Want to talk to you about that in a sec. But you mentioned Keith and Seabrook early on. Uh, Jonathan Taves, like, is anybody in hockey talking about Jonathan Taves? Uh, do we know if he's going to continue to play? We know that the door is closed in Chicago. They're moving on. Uh, we saw the fond farewell at the end of last season, but uh, have you heard any rumblings about Jonathan Taves here in the offseason? I have not heard one word uh, of all the free agents. You know, uh, we heard tons about Tarasenko until yesterday. We heard tons about Matt Dumba, what's going on with him. We've even heard that uh, we've heard we've heard more about Patrick Kane and his surgery, and when yeah. he might be ready for the for the the fall than we have Jonathan Taves. And and yet you do have to wonder about that. The the one thing you you do have to have the concern is uh, if anybody's talked to him, money's not going to be the issue for him, but it's what role he will have on a team. Um, and then you know, what's his durability now? What's his energy level now? considering what he's all gone through the last couple of years, Jeff. And what about Bergeron? Uh, I mean, when you think of Patrice Bergeron and all the winning that he's done, uh, the leadership, the two-way ability, obviously, um, what jumps to mind when I say Patrice Bergeron? Well, what comes to mind to me is the, the real impact he made on the international stage for this country, particularly when you think about what he did in Vancouver in 2010. You know, he was he was a late addition to that club. Uh, and before the, the, the tournament ended and before Sid scored the golden goal, Patrice Bergeron became a valuable member of that team uh, and was a was a huge part of 2014. Um, you, you, he, he's you know, he, he's such a he he's the type of guy that makes me jealous. Honestly, it makes me so <laughs> jealous because, I mean, beloved in Boston, beloved in Canada, beloved in Quebec. I mean, we're talking about three different markets that he makes a huge difference in uh, and three fan bases that have nothing but utter respect for what he's done. And the fact that he can speak fluently in both languages without an accent on any of them, that to me is amazing as a person, let alone a player. Still in the car there, Shannon? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, listen, um, I, you know, I would... and Price, when Sakaris and Price call, <laughs> you answer, man. <laughs> right. Uh, we we talked about the 2010 team here earlier in the week, and of course, his two greatest hockey triumphs were here at Rogers uh, Rogers Arena. But the 2014 team, John, particularly the way Babcock coached it, right, to be a defensive oriented club and say we're going to give up nothing with Carey Price at the back, and then we'll get enough goals to win. Like, to me, he was kind of the signature player 
uh, no. on that club because he had been doing that his whole career, right? I'm going to make sure that we don't get scored upon first and foremost before we go scoring our own goals. And if we do that, then we're going to be successful. And, you know, I'm not sure there was a, a player that more epitomized that than Patrice Bergeron at the 2014 games in Sochi. I, I do wonder, and if, if you probably got a couple of good old moose heads in our, our pal Sidney Crosby, if you could really ask him what influence Bergeron had on his game overall. Because in my mind, as great as Bergeron was as a player, a 200-foot game, and I know it's a cliche, but it's so real for him, the influence in what he taught Crosby early on, even even in, in junior circles at the World Junior Hockey Championships, uh, and then on those Olympic teams, and now Sidney Crosby has become one of the great 200-foot players as well after some great offensive skills. You, that, to me, is, is his influence on so many different levels. I, you know, I, I'm, it's one of those ones where I'm, I'm not a Bruin fan. I'm not a fan of really any team in the NHL, but I'm sad for the game that, you know, that uh, this guy has to leave for whatever reason and by his own choice. Uh, I'm happy he's yeah. able to make a choice because, as the three of us can identify, sometimes you can't make your own choices when you leave. Uh, yes. But, you know, for him to leave, the game isn't better. The game is not better today no. with Patrice Bergeron out of it. And to follow up on Jeff's question, if Jonathan Taves winds up retiring this summer as well, I mean, that's two of the all-time 200-foot centermen uh, mm -hmm. that we would well, and two guys that made a huge summer. impact in 2010 as well. I mean, yep. to talk about uh, coming out parties – uh, for those guys internationally, uh, Taves and and Bergeron were so good uh, at the tournament at uh, at at the uh, at the arena in Vancouver that year. I I wouldn't miss yeah. a game, and those guys made it fun to watch. God, John, all this talking about 2010 and 2014 has me yearning for best on best hockey again. Please tell me you've heard something good that you know we're going to see that with this young great star Connor mcdavid and of course our new great star Connor mc uh, Connor bedard here from the north Shore. gotta see those guys playing together on a canadian team it's i i think before before they go to torino i think we are going to see a february 2025 world cup yeah fair enough uh did you want to ask yeah him? i just uh, the signing of Vladimir Tarasenko in Ottawa. It's a one-year deal, fairly low risk. Guy can still score goals. John, the Sens have a lot of really nice pieces. Are you buying what they're selling there in the nation's capital? That's a great question. You know, um, you know, J Sanderson's such a good player. Shabbat needs to make a comeback. We didn't have a good year last year. Um, you know, we all know Brady Kachuk, how good he can be. Um, they might scare a few teams this year. If Vladimir if Tarasenko got the message this summer is, you know what, you're not the be all and the end all, and you're going to have to prove yourself one more time. If we see Tarasenko get a 40 goal season, Jeff, they could be a scary team. Pretty good depth down center ice too. Uh, Stutzla, if Norris bounces back and Pinto had a very nice year for them last year, might have a battle of Ontario back on our hands here. Ooh, which has been dormant that be for something? a number of years. John, marvelous stuff. Have yourself a great week, and we will catch up next Friday. Thanks, John. Thanks, right on, boys. Happy Friday. This is a Price Clip brought to you by Applewood Auto Group. And remember, it's all good at Applewood.